Okay, so now we are we are at the top of the hour and we are ready we are ready to go to the, to go live. So hello everyone and uh, officially welcome to today's uh, Terra Mechanics Byte in the ISTVS uh, digital event series. Uh, I'm your host uh, Massimo Martelli and. Um, as usual, I would like to invite you to drop in a, a short introduction uh, in the session chat and use the session Q&A tab uh, to type questions for our speaker. After the presentation, you'll also have the possibility to join the live discussion uh, by clicking the blue button uh, at the top right uh, to share your audio and video, and a moderator uh, will admit you. So today's talk is on experimental and modeling aspects of pneumatic tire performance on soft soil and icy roads. And our speaker uh, today is Dr. Corina Sandu. Corina is the president of the ISTVS. Uh, she is a professor in the mechanical engineering department at Virginia Tech and associate department head for graduate studies and director of the Terra Mechanics Multibody and Vehicle Systems Laboratory. Her research expertise lies in Terra Mechanics on uh, vehicle terrain interaction, tire track modeling, vehicle mobility, and soil terrain modeling. In multibody dynamics uh, on modeling, simulation, and uncertainty quantification. Uh, parameter uh, estimation, sensitivity analysis, and design optimization, and in vehicle dynamics on suspension, handling, ride, and performance. So now, Corina, whenever you're ready, uh, the, floor's, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, I'll just, Massimo. I'll just stop Appreciate my that. share. And uh, just one uh, recommendation for... Uh, our team, uh, if you uh, if you would uh, pl please um, switch off your video during your uh, your presentation, so, so that uh, could probably uh, be better for uh, for the recording. Let me just uh, get a quick a quick confirmation uh, about that. Can any can anyone please? Yes. Okay. I just received confirmation. Okay. So, um, okay. I'll uh, I'll just disconnect and uh, I'll leave it to you. Oh, well, thank you very much, Massimo. Uh, just uh, to let you know, uh, in the presentation mode on my screen, I cannot see the chat or the Q and A. So, uh, if there is anything that needs my attention for that, I'd uh, pre pretty much appreciate if you can interrupt me. Uh, and and ask or let me know. Yeah, sure, sure. We'll I, I only can see the the slides. Okay, no problem. We'll take care of that. All right. Thank you. So thank you everyone for attending today's presentation. Uh, it's an honor to speak to you today. Um, for uh, for the purpose of this uh, talk, I selected um, some highlights of our past work in experimental and modeling aspects of pneumatic tire performance on soft soil and icy roads um, as massimo already mentioned um, this is uh, not intended to be a very in-depth technical talk in each one of the of the topics of course i am trying to highlight some of the research that has been going on in uh, in my lab um, and um, we can we can have um, hopefully a, a very uh, uh, live and uh, an interesting Q and A session at the end. Um, Massimo already uh, mentioned some of my um, research areas. I know that this is uh, primarily a terra mechanics community um, and off road vehicle dynamics community, but. Uh, I just wanted to let you know that um, in my laboratory, uh, we have students who uh, focus on other topics uh, such as uh, 
uh, right now, for example, sensitivity analysis and design optimization of multi-body dynamic systems with contact and friction, um, as well as parameter estimation. And um, although not current, we've also had projects on tracked uh, vehicles. Right now, we're primarily uh, looking at wheeled vehicles. So uh, with, uh, with this being said, um, let me go to the highlight uh, of the outlines of the presentation. Um, I'm going to give you a brief uh, motivation and research objectives and then uh, present a little bit about the capabilities of our test rig. Um, and then I will um, give some um, uh, experimental study results for uh, traction of tires on soft soil. Uh, then I will uh, briefly describe the hybrid soft soil tire model developed in our lab. And then we will move on to ice, and I will also uh, briefly describe the advanced higher ice interface model also uh, developed in our lab. Uh, you see here a snapshot from one of uh, our uh, group uh, team meetings from the fall semester when we, uh, we interacted only on Zoom. Um, you'll, uh, you'll see more pictures with my uh, current students at the end of the uh, presentation but I wanted to acknowledge them here. So um, why are we uh, studying these, um, uh, these topics? Uh, well, primarily because deformable terrain as well as rough terrain, uh, and of course for on-road situations, icy roads are very important and they do influence the tire performance and the vehicle performance. So we have to understand how the tire will perform uh, in such challenging conditions um, and study them under uh, different operating conditions. So uh, furthermore, uh, we need to incorporate these two, um, all the, all the uh, knowledge that we gain from the experimental data, we want to incorporate it in more accurate and more efficient tire models for such um, severe environments. Um, a few words about our test rig. Um, in 2005-2006, <clears throat> we started <clears throat> excuse me, uh, designing this uh, test rig, um, and uh, it was uh, designed from scratch um, by a few of our master students. You have uh, the um, two uh, images here showing the test rig in the configuration in which we test on soil on the bottom left and uh, on ice on the upper right uh, portion of the screen. Uh, the idea was that we wanted to have an indoor testing equipment you know, that we can use to test the performance of tires under different conditions um, while uh, controlling the condition of the terrain as well as all the um, aspects related to the tire, the tire inflation pressure, the tire, uh, the normal load applied on the tire, uh, camber angle, toe angle, etc. So um, therefore we, we want you to have this, as I mentioned earlier, indoors. And uh, we designed this test rig, which allows for sleep control uh, via two separate uh, drive motors, one that uh, translates the carriage uh, in the longitudinal direction of the test rig, the test rig is 25 feet long, six feet wide, and four feet high. And um, the second motor um, applies torque on the tire. <clears throat> and uh, by correlating the tangential velocity um, on the tire and the longitudinal velocity of the carriage, we can create anything from uh, negative 100% to positive 100% sleep. Uh, all the forces and the moments at the wheel hub are measured by a Kistler P650 sensor, which uses piezoelectric sensors. Uh, so we collect um, the normal load, longitudinal lateral forces, um, as well as all the uh, moments. Uh, for the configuration on ice, we created um, 
an enclosure like you see on the right hand side. Um, the indoor temperature is not controlled, so we want to maintain the tire as close to the ice temperature as possible. Uh, thus, we freeze the tires before testing. The ice temperature is uh, maintained um, using a system uh, with uh, ethylene glycol uh, circulating through pipes. Uh, we create about three inches of ice on top of those pipes and uh, the tire uh, is being mounted on the test rig at a temperature uh, with probably about uh, 10 Celsius less than the temperature of the ice, such that uh, during the calibration of the, of the test rig, uh, the tire um, during the warm up will probably reach very, very close uh, temperatures to the ice temperature before we start the testing. Before we start the testing, such an enclosure can be uh, added such that we maintain the air around the tire as close to the um, tire and ice temperature as possible. Um, we have the ability to adjust the, the camber and the toe angles. Uh, the camber angle uh, can be increased in increments um, of two degrees, but in the lower range also 0 0.5 degrees and the toe or slip angle uh, between minus 25 and plus 25 degrees in uh, increments of five degrees, but also again in the lower range, um, we also have the ability to increase it in smaller uh, increments. Um, we designed these to be uh, as accurate as possible and also very robust. Uh, we are regulating the normal load. Um, from uh, past studies, we uh, concluded that we can maintain uh, less than 3% uh, variation in the normal load while navigating on soft soil. Uh, we also are able to measure the terrain elevation um, using uh, ultrasonic sensors. And um, we also design um, in the lab a set of sensors called uh, WITS, uh, wireless internal tire sensors uh, that can be mounted inside the tire and measure in real time the deflection of the tire as it navigates um, on any kind of surface. Uh, the, the main reason we designed this system was to be able to uh, properly um, estimate the maximum sinkage and um, to do that in real time. Uh, this is a schematic of uh, the carriage of the test rig. Uh, indicating uh, how we calculate uh, the, um, the sinkage, uh, the maximum sinkage, uh, by knowing uh, the height H, uh, which is um, obtained by the measurements given by the string potentiometer and also the wheel to string uh, potentiometer distance. Uh, which is uh, something that we can uh, we can easily measure. Actually, it's uh, written here estimated, but it can be measured um, as well as the deformed radius of the tire, which is provided by the width uh, sensors and knowing the initial height of the terrain provided by the ultrasound uh, sensor. So uh, thus, in real time, we can we can obtain the delta Z. Um, of course, before we start uh, conducting uh, measurements, um, we measure the soil properties um, via different methods. In, uh, indicated here um, is, for example, on the left, a set of data collected using a cone penetrometer. Um, or, um, of course, we can do a geotechnical uh, laboratory test. Uh, for the time being, we characterize the uh, soil we have, which is a sandy loam. So these tests are not being repeated every time. But the compaction of the of the soil is very important. So that aspect is being measured every time we need to conduct um, we conduct the uh, tests on uh, soil. Um, so the way that uh, the tests are being uh, run is first, um, and I think I have a slide later on 
uh, with the preparation of the soil, uh, we basically uh, disturb the soil between uh, each test run unless we want to study the multipass effect. Uh, we level it, we compact it, we measure the compaction and the moisture uh, by a volumetric method. And then um, if, the, if the compaction is sufficient, then we start the test. If it's not sufficient, we, um, we compact further. Uh, the kind of uh, experiments that we can conduct uh, are illustrated here. Uh, so, for example, we are interested here in a sleep ratio ranging from zero to, let's say, 90% uh, sleep. Uh, we uh, realize that at 90% sleep, um, the, the tire digs too much into the soil and that the normal load controller cannot keep up with applying the needed load to keep the tire um, in contact with the ground at the desired a normal load so uh, we stopped the, the sleep ratio actually measurements at 75 percent we can look at different normal loads like five kilonewtons six kilonewtons in this uh in this design of experiment we can vary the inflation pressure we can vary the compaction resistance and then uh, we have um uh, depending on the, the type of experiment we conduct the uh, um, different uh, combinations of uh, of levels uh, and um, the results I'm showing here will be for the uh, 16 inch uh, Michelin tire indicated here. Uh, you have a visual representation of how the soil looks like at the different percentage uh, ratios of uh, slip uh, ratio uh, and uh, you can see the very uh, you know very deep uh, hole that was left uh, or rod that was left at, at 90 percent so we stopped um, as i mentioned taking the measurements earlier um we can study one individual parameter change at a time uh such as in these cases uh where we uh, look at the drawbar pull coefficient uh versus the sleep ratio when for example we keep the level two of the compaction resistance. Uh, that's the first plot on the left, upper left, uh, with the line in green. And you can see how um, the, um, the different configurations where we run all levels one uh, for three individual runs, and then we change and we uh, have three other runs for the second uh, level. Uh, of the compaction uh, rate. Uh, we illustrated here all three runs. Typically we do somewhere between three and five runs. And then we, uh, we take the average of those results. You can see the same in the other two plots where we have uh, the representation where we change the levels in the normal load or in the uh, tire pressure. And um, you can analyze the behavior um, for other studies, we also looked at the spread of these data, what is the standard deviation, for example, and, and you can see that uh, the grouping, uh, even for just these three runs, is pretty, uh, pretty good. Uh, we think it is acceptable. We can also change several parameters uh, simultaneously and uh, do an analysis. Uh, the spread of the data here is larger. Uh, we do prefer to look at changes in one parameter at a time to be able to identify the reason for which uh, such changes are uh, happening. Um, and, and of course, there might be some sort of um, uncertainties in the preparation of the soil as well. Um, I am going to move uh, now to the development of the hybrids of soil tire model. Uh, some of you may be uh, familiar with this. We presented uh, the first results for this tire model um, in um, the ISTBS conference in, uh, in uh, South Korea. Um, the idea was uh, that we wanted to develop an accurate and computationally efficient tire model for soft soil. Now, this was the final goal, but uh, in the process of developing it, we realized that the tire model has to be developed uh, first uh, as a tire 
um, to navigate on on um, rigid flat ground and then validate the tire um, structure itself and then validate the tire terrain interaction model. So we proceeded with two venues, the mathematical modeling and the physical modeling. In the mathematical modeling, we looked at the material, the tire material first, and then the tire structure, and then the tire ground interaction. Uh, in terms of the physical modeling, we had to perform a parametrization procedure that would give us the data needed to parameterize the computational model. And then uh, we also performed um, uh, physical tests in the lab uh, that will allow us to um, all verify the computational model as well as validate and improve uh, the model after the simulation results were obtained. Um, and um, it is, uh, uh, to me, uh, the, the tire modeling and the tire terrain uh, interaction is one of the most exciting areas of research because it basically brings together uh, all aspects that um, I'm very interested in uh, for uh, the student who developed this, uh, this uh, code, uh, Shahyar Tahiri. Um, this was uh, basically um, um, bringing together knowledge in multi-body dynamics needed to develop the tire structure model, entire modeling, of course, in vehicle simulation as well as in terra mechanics to be able to, to capture the tire ground interaction. Um, the, the tire model was structured uh, to be uh, modular. We thought of the tire as being uh, able to be divided in several user-defined number of layers and each layer would be divided in a user-defined number of lumped masses. Those lumped masses were connected by combinations of springs and dampers. Um, uh, in, in this diagram, I'm illustrating in blue uh, the layers um, simulating the sidewall, and you have the, the top view on the uh, bottom uh, of the figure. And in red, we had the thread and the belt layer. Uh, someone may define multiple of each one of these layers. We decided to go with three. Um, the number of lump messes, again, can vary. I think we used 100 for the purpose of this uh, model. Now, um, one advantage of this model, and I think I also have that mentioned somewhere towards the end, is that it needs a very limited number of parameters. Um, we, we need eight parameters to parameterize the model that can be obtained and uh, it is much more computationally efficient than a finite element tire model. So it can be used for vehicle dynamic simulations. In the same time, it is much more accurate than a simple uh, one uh, degree of freedom um, spring damper model that's typically used for rough terrain vehicle dynamic simulations, for example. So we had to take into account two different types of contact models. Uh, the first one would be uh, for the contact with non-deformable terrain uh, to validate our tire model on, um, on road. Uh, in this case, we included uh, two methods for the friction dynamics. First was a relaxation uh, land-based approach, and uh, this uh, is uh, pretty much an extension of uh, the well-known magic formula tire model. And the second one was a three-dimensional brush model uh, based on a first order Lugre dynamic friction model. For the contact with deformable terrain, uh, we, um, if we imagine discretizing the terrain in uh, such a fashion as shown on the right side of the slide here, uh, then we looked at the effect of um, the contact between a point on the tire and a point on the ground uh, by looking at uh, the effect of uh, this contact in different directions. So now looking at the diagram on the left, we identify, for example, that the tangential contact velocity will produce the shear stress by friction, uh, while the uh, contact, vertical contact velocity will produce the soil compaction and radial soil displacement. In the same time, um, the normal contact velocity, if we look in the normal plane of the uh, tire contacting the terrain, 
uh, will produce the plastic soil deformation. And if we uh, decompose that into, uh, so looking at the horizontal contact velocity, uh, that will produce the shear stress by internal shear, uh, soil friction, internal soil shear friction and the horizontal soil bulldozing. So depending on uh, the type of uh, surface you're navigating on, one of these models was used, either the previous, the one in the previous slide for non-deformable terrain or all of these aspects being considered for each contact node for deformable ground. Um, I mentioned earlier the parametrization procedure. It's something that's very important. Uh, we use the model analysis and finite element analysis to obtain some tire model initial parameters. We use test data um, from measured uh, tire inputs and we perform a least square optimization to obtain the optimized model uh, parameters. Um, in, uh, in order to visualize uh, the performance of the tire, I'm showing here a couple of simulation results. On the left, you have a visualization of uh, the, the way that the forces um, show, are, are uh, showing in the contact patch. Uh, for the tire, uh, actually we have a quarter car simulated here with the tire attached uh, on a flat rigid surface during maneuvers such as parking and turning. Um, the visualization um, is, is shown to, to look like a tire, but you see the three layers that we really modeled and um, the fact that uh, such a difficult maneuver you know, can be actually well captured with uh, this model. On the right, you have the, the tire uh, with the, the quarter car model simulated climbing up um, a ramp um, and um, we can perform other maneuvers uh, on rigid terrain as well. Uh, in terms of navigation on uh, soft soil, um, on the left, uh, you see the way that we also take into account uh, the changes that occur uh, in, the, in the terrain uh, by uh, illustrating the sinkage left by the tire uh, and also the, um, uh, the, the rut left by the tire and also taking into account those changes not only in the terrain topology, but also in the soil properties when the second uh, pass uh, happens over the same area. Uh, on the right, we have uh, one tire that actually goes in um, two parallel um, runs here, but on the second pass, we have the tire running one more time and you can see the sinkage increasing with the additional uh, pass. So, um, of course, the tire forces that are computed uh, with each additional pass will take into account the new soil properties and terrain topology. Uh, we validated the tire model using uh, our uh, indoor test rig described earlier, as well as um, some um, software um, such as car sim uh, for for uh, different uh, characteristics, but primarily and and some um, uh, outdoors experimental uh, data, uh, and uh, for example for the longitudinal force, uh, we um, show on the left uh, the correlation between the simulation which is in uh, the orange with the test data in the blue. And we see that um, we are within the standard uh, deviation of the test data. Uh, the R square uh, for the curve fit on the right, uh, showing also data for the longitudinal force at the tire shows a very high correlation of 0 0.91. And uh, we have similar results shown for the sinkage, for the lateral, uh, force, um, especially in the middle range, um, as well as for the um, uh, MZ uh, moment. Um, I would uh, like to move now uh, to the 
uh, study um, or to the way that we are conducting studies on ice. Um, and um, what you see here is what we are actually doing once we, uh, we conclude uh, an experimental study on soft soil, uh, we remove the extra uh, soil that uh, sits on top of these uh, lateral uh, support beams that you can see in the middle uh, figure, and we lay horizontal steel plates on top of which we have plastic insulation and then another uh, layer of plastic and then we place our uh, customized um, ice system. So this ice system uh, again uh, consists of pipes that um, through which uh, uh, ethylene glycol is circulated and um, we design the uh, we, we define the temperature at which uh, that ethylene glycol should be. We start spraying the um, pipes with water about one millimeter per hour and let it freeze. And it takes about four or five days to, to reach the desired ice thickness of about three inches before we can start testing. Now that ice temperature will be maintained. We have a thermocouple that's uh, placed on the ice and we continuously measure the temperature uh, to, to ensure that the ice temperature is um, the one that we desire. Uh, we used to have a thermotron to freeze the tires uh, that was very old and we, we changed it. Now we have a different freezer. Uh, that's the insulation box I mentioned for the tire. Um, some tools to measure to, to polish the um, the ice at the desired friction coefficient, which we measure before we start testing. And we usually uh, try to uh, have a coefficient of friction for the ice around 0 0.15. Um, the design of experiment is relatively similar to what we do for uh, soil. Uh, in this case, uh, we looked at, uh, for example, these three uh, types of uh, or three different uh, tires. Um, and a um, couple of, uh, you know, different values for the camber angle and toe angle, three different normal loads, three different inflation, inflation pressures, two different ice uh, surface temperature, and I think, again, eight uh, sleep ratios. Of course, for ice, we do not go past 45% uh, percent, uh, sleep ratio. The, the tire is already sleeping in place at that uh, that sleep ratio. Uh, so the useful uh, range, um, uh, it's sufficient if we go up to 30%. Um, the reason we selected two different ice surface temperatures uh, was because we wanted to mimic as much as possible dry friction at the minus 10 Celsius, but with the minus 3 Celsius, and then later on in other studies, we perform minus 1 or 0 Celsius, uh, some superficial layer of water occurs on the ice. So we are getting into either a combination of dry and wet friction or pure wet friction on ice. Um, in this diagram, similar to what you've seen for soil, we illustrate, uh, typically we look at the drawbar pull coefficient with respect to sleep um, and um, for different uh, inflation pressures. For example, here we have uh, no uh, camber angle. We have 100% load index uh, on the left, 80% inflation pressure, uh, but on the, um, uh, we, we vary the toe angle uh, for zero, two, and minus two degrees. On the right side, we vary the camber angle for these uh, values. Um, what's uh, interesting to, to notice here is that, of course, um, the experimental results obtained are, are relatively close to, to each other. Um, the difference in the toe angle was maybe a little bit more evident than in the, in the camber angle. Uh, again, keep in mind that uh, we are running at a relatively low speed, also being indoor, we cannot reach very high um, uh, longitudinal velocities of the carriage. So other um, experimental results here obtained with, for example, three different, different inflation pressures. The lower uh, inflation pressure gave the best 
uh, drawbar pull coefficient reaching about 0 0.21, uh, while the 100% um, inflation pressure, which uh, is uh, the nominal inflation pressure uh, for the respective tire being used on dry um, roads, is uh, is closer to 0 0.17. Um, now, um, some observations, uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, my, at minus three Celsius, we notice a thin um, water film. Uh, you can see also the difference in the traction between dry ice and wet ice. Um, and um, also, uh, this was uh, for um, the, the top uh, chart is for the SRTT, the 14-inch SRTT. Uh, the bottom uh, plot was for a Pirelli tire. The difference for this was a, a smaller um, uh, than, um, than for the SRTT. Uh, the Pirelli tire was a 19-inch uh, 19 Pirelli tire. Uh, just for curiosity, we try to treat the at the end of the experiment. Um, Anudeep conducted this uh, in test in 2015. We we uh, dumped a lot of stuff on the ice. Uh, wanted to see how the traction will behave if we, for example, um, put some dry soil on it, uh, if we put salt, or if we have a slush with soil on ice, meaning some water, some soil, some ice. Uh, obviously, the, um, the the lowest traction we would get would be with the wet ice at maybe 0 0.15 maximum at about 10% sleep. Uh, with dry ice, it would go close to about 0 0.3. If we add some uh, some soil, uh, as, as you probably saw, trucks dumping um, sand or soil on ice in the winter, that increases the traction to a 0 0.4 and a little bit. If there is also some salt, that increases it further. And um, to our surprise, the slush with both of them increased it quite a bit. You would not expect this because, uh, you know, um, it you're, you have some of this wet ice effect. But in fact, the... Uh, it, it did help the traction quite a bit because of the the soil that was mixed with um, with the water at that time. Now um, the intent to model uh, the interface here was um, basically to try and understand uh, how the tire ice uh, interface behaves from uh, multiple uh, points of view. So. Um, we uh, we were primarily interested in obtaining uh, what you see in this module four output, the viscous ice uh, friction due to the water film, the flash temperature rise, the wet and dry regions of the contact patch so that, such that we can calculate the respective uh, tractive forces for each one of them, the temperature rise in the contact patch, um, that is also very important because in addition to uh, the temperature uh, rise due to pressure uh, or due to the uh, due to the tire being at a certain temperature, there is a temperature rise uh, just because um, the, the tire will roll on the ice. So we'll show some results for that later on. Um, the water film uh, height at the contact area is very important for tire manufacturers, uh, for tire design. Dry friction coefficient from the uh, heat balance in the contact patch, and finally, prediction of the drawbar pull performance. So um, this uh, interface uh, model, uh, again, some of you might, might be familiar with it. Emilio presented it, and uh, we published it in, in the Journal of Thermomechanics as well. Uh, consists of uh, an, a module including the inputs needed um, from the experiment, uh, which uh, in this case is the experimental pressure distribution in the contact patch and the contact patch geometry. Uh, the temperature measurements at the contact interface and the measured drawbar pull at the contact um, interface, um, which was, was done again on the test read. Uh, 
The second module are user inputs uh, related to the sleep ratio, which we could control thermal properties of the ice and the thread, rubber composition, ambient and ice temperature. The third uh, module is the one in which we do a lot of calculation um, and um, uh, something I forgot to mention when describing the test rig was that um, in um, about 2017, 18, we upgraded the test rig by including a clutch and a brake. So uh, we can also control, uh, we can also perform a free rolling test as well as a braking test. Um, so uh, these uh, modules uh, are included in the uh, module three uh, for calculation. And then of course we have the validation of the output with uh, some of the experimental data collected. Um, the temperature um, of the tire ice interface uh, was initially measured by uh, Anudeep uh, with uh, an infrared camera mounted on the Terra Mechanics rig. Um, and you have here some of the uh, data temperature range accuracy. Uh, the camera pointed to the tire footprint on ice, but um, as you can imagine, not inside the surface, at, just at the outside contact. Um, later on, Emilio uh, moved one step further and included thermocouples in the thread of the tire, uh, eight thermocouples with the configuration shown here that will measure the temperature really in the contact area with every revolution. And uh, this gave us the opportunity to basically validate the model. Um, the um, measured pressure distribution that we used uh, in Anudip's uh, original model was provided by Hancock Tires, uh, where they basically used um, applied torque uh, to, to simulate um, a certain uh, sleep ratio. Uh, but based on this uh, pressure distribution, we calculated the temperature rise with uh, with Anodip's uh, tire model, and then um, we we try to validate it using uh, the two uh, methods. So uh, the figure on the bottom is the validation done uh, by Anodip using the infrared camera, where we can see the temperature <clears throat> in the entry. Um, region of the tire ice interface at minus 7.2 Celsius. At the exit, it was minus 5.1 Celsius. Emilio's data shown here indicates the temperature that was read directly in the contact area. And you can see the global uh, correlation that we have uh, between the temperature given by the thermocouples and the temperature given by the uh, in, uh, infrared camera. Um, then we uh, looked at the heat transfer module, uh, and you see here the um, uh, progression between how we uh, we started with the pressure distribution. We calculate, we used it in the module where we calculated the temperature distribution in the contact patch, and then based on that temperature, we identify regions such as this one of uh, because uh, uh, where um, the temperature was higher, we estimated that it will probably be uh, a thin layer of water, and this was considered wet friction. And at the lower temperatures, we would have dry uh, friction. Um, we also calculated the water uh, film height, and this is a 3D representation of the height of the water film in the contact area. Uh, again, uh, this was something that our um, industrial advisory board members, uh, this uh, type of projects were conducted for the Center for Tire Research at Virginia Tech, um, was one of the things they were very interested in. Uh, under braking conditions for three different normal loads, uh, these are the 
um, lateral um, and uh, position versus longitudinal position temperature rise in the contact area. And as you can see, uh, the temperature rise um, is um, um, higher uh, in, in an area uh, related to um, the 4,000 uh, newtons uh, in this uh, diagram, um, rather than, um, for example, uh, for the 7,000 uh, newton. Uh, now, uh, this uh, again is experimental data uh, obtained in our uh, laboratory and um, well, the, the data we obtained in the lab was, was used to, to validate these models, uh, but these were for uh, the braking condition. The, the problem was that we really um, um, did not uh, control the braking force uh, for each one of these situations uh, in the experiment because we have um, a handbrake and yes, we can break, but we do not really measure the braking force. So it was a little bit more challenging to do the correlation between the model and the, um, the simulation for the braking part. Um, so now what do we do with this uh, tire ice uh, interface model? We want to include it in a vehicle model uh, and um, Emilio included it in uh, Pacheca's uh, tire model in car seam. The blue car uh, represents the, the modified uh, Pacheca model. Uh, the, the black one represents the original model and the surface uh, has the coefficient of friction of ice. And uh, you can see the, the difference in uh, how successful uh, the, v, the blue vehicle completes uh, the double, uh, cha double lane change uh, maneuver. So um, we found that uh, by incorporating this contact model in, uh, in such vehicle simulations will improve um, the performance. Um, I would like to thank all of my past uh, students, master students and, and uh, PhD students. Um, I graduated 22 master students. Uh, these are some of them. You, uh, those of you who have been with ISTBS for a long time probably uh, recognize uh, several names or uh, faces in here. Um, the last four graduated uh, basically during COVID. Uh, they didn't have yet a chance to, to attend the commencement ceremony. I hope to see them at commencement soon and 18 uh, PhD students um, and part of their work was also presented today and I want to acknowledge all of their contributions to the, um, the research that we've done through the years and again most recent graduates uh, who did not have a chance to to attend the graduation ceremony yet. Uh, right now um, um, I would like to um, I would like to mention my uh, current uh, PhD students. Um, I have eight PhD students. I also would like to acknowledge my two master students. Um, for a couple of them, I don't yet have pictures. I hope we'll take pictures together soon. Um, several of them are, um, are attending this presentation today and uh, many of them are working on topics related to Terra Mechanics aspects. Um, all of this work could not have been possible without uh, the support uh, of our sponsors. Uh, we had uh, several agencies and companies um, who supported us through the years, uh, NSF, Automotive Research Center, uh, Engineering Research and Development Center, um, the NSF IOCRC Center for Tire Research at Virginia Tech, uh, Goodyear, the Aspires program at Virginia Tech, uh, Caterpillar, Sumitomo Tires, and many, uh, many other companies uh, whose names uh, don't appear on this slide, but who, who helped support us uh, through the years. So uh, with this, I uh, want to thank everybody for attending the presentation. 
um, I might have moved a little bit faster uh, than um, than maybe um, at the conference uh, presentation, but I wanted to leave some time for uh, for Q and A. So thank you all for your attention. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Corina, for your presentation. And uh, so now I would like to uh, officially start the live live discussion uh, part of this this event. So, uh, as I said in my intro, I I would like to invite uh, anyone who wants to to join us uh, here on stage to please click the blue button on the top right. And I see, I see Ray is already here. Hello, Ray. Hello. Hello. <laughs> and well, I see we have, I also see. Uh, I see questions, yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll let, uh, of course, I'll let the people uh, ask uh, their question here on stage. And then, then I'll go back to, to the questions that were typed in the chat. Uh, before we start, I see we have. Alex, we have Skalk uh, here on, on the event today. So, of course, you are very welcome to to join us. Uh, and I think you will uh, have some very interesting contributions to, to the discussion. So uh, we are waiting for you here on stage. And in the meantime, uh, yeah, Ray, uh, you are the first one, please. Uh, Dr. Sandy, I've two questions um, sure. for your hybrid soft soil tar model how do you measure the soil properties and does it incorporate um, for the the shear stress displacement um, or is it just right a peak so friction? the the model the model uh, basically assumes uh, the model was developed with the intent of um, having a tire able to navigate on all sorts of terrain, right? Uh, so we focus primarily on developing the, mo the model for the tire and the model for the interface between the tire and whatever surface it navigates on. So we assume that we know the properties of the soil. Um, in the lab, we, we have the soft soil very well characterized, so we know those properties we don't have to do it. It's not um, measured in real time. So the soil properties have to be known a priori for that model. But um, in that measurement, did you use a bevameter in situ measurement or is the laboratory technique uh, to measure the soil properties? So um, for the soft soil we have in the rig, uh, we actually had a geotechnical company characterize it in the lab and in situ. Uh, so we have properties um, for everything that relates to that soil. Triaxial okay. tests, um, particle distribution, um, capacity of holding moisture. Uh, we had all the California bearing uh, tests being done and what the only thing that we do before we start testing is to measure the compaction and the moisture. And the compaction is measured with a cone penetrometer and uh, the moisture is measured by taking a sample and uh, weighting it and drying it in the microwave and measuring it again, so volumetric. Okay, and I have uh, one more question. Um, how does your soft soil tire model compare to the classical backer Wong approach? Um, I know in 2011 you wrote a paper uh, that did the 2D discretization for a pneumatic tire. So, how does the so hybrid soft soil tire model compare to the, um, you know, discretized backer Wong model? So, uh, the uh, this model started actually from the idea of having um, a simpler version of the F tire. Um, so uh, for the interface with the ground, yes, we do use uh, Becker Wong relations and uh, pretty much uh, all the terra mechanics uh, uh, classical approaches, except we, we incorporated 
uh, you know, the ability to um, account for the multi-pass uh, and, and update the terrain topology and the terrain of the soil properties. But uh, the tire model, again, started with the idea that um, we could not afford uh, the F tire, uh, primarily because the parametrization is, is very expensive. Uh, and we don't need all the features of the F tire model as well. And we wanted something that will run uh, relatively uh, fast to, to allow for vehicle dynamics uh, simulations. So uh, our uh, approach, uh, I think, might be different. Maybe, I, I mean, I have to, to go back and look at the details of that project, but I, I know that for our model, the, the types of springs and dampers and their configuration is probably unique, um, as well as the... Uh, the modularity of allowing the user to increase or, or uh, decrease its complexity in terms of how many layers you use, how many uh, masses you use. We realize that after a certain point, you do not gain more accuracy and you, you spend too much time in the computation. So that's why we, for the illustration here, I chose uh, one of our basic configurations. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. The main advantage that we, we saw was, uh, in addition to the computational efficiency, was the parametrization. Um, again, the whole model needs eight, eight variables that can be obtained through those three methods that we mentioned, the, the model analysis, some physical you know, loading uh, tests on the tire, as well as uh, any parameters that you may not have for material properties properties that can be obtained maybe from a, an existing finite element model. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for the questions. Okay. Uh, I see we have Elsa Bieta. I hope I'm not butchering your name. If uh, And uh, she had already typed a question in the chat. I'll let her ask the question live, please. May I? Uh, yeah, so Elizabeth, you can call me Ella. It's just simpler. <laughs> so first of all, Corina, thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. I really, I really liked it. And uh, I have uh, generally two questions. Uh, um, first of all, it relates to your attire model, uh, which you presented. It looks very attractive because it's simple. Yes, it's simple in the number of parameters. So, uh, uh, based upon your uh, research and experiments, uh, is it possible, to, uh, is that model a, a kind of complete in the sense that I can um, take uh, the model uh, with the parameters and uh, uh, use it? And yes, we, uh, we, only, uh, we only validated it though on, on the tire that we use for testing. Okay. So I think it, it will be very nice if we could have the tire model apply to, to simulate other tires and do some additional validation. Um, as far as, as my um, colleague, uh, Saita Harry, who co-advised uh, Shahiar with me and, and the student, we pretty much think that the model is, you know, complete. Um, but obviously additional validation needs to be done for other tires to to ensure that um that will work well the at the end of the project that was a project funded by the automotive research center and uh basically under the same project we developed that width sensor system that measured the deflection of the tire mm -hmm. uh, and this tire model so at the end of the, the project, we uh, submitted a disclosure to Virginia Tech for the, for the model. Um, so that's uh, something that's available. It didn't end up into a patent because the university wants us to find someone to purchase it first. <laughs> but uh, it is definitely uh, a package that's available to be used. Okay, perfect. And my, my second question is about the IC uh, surface, because me and my PhD students, uh, uh, we do a slip modeling and the final goal will, will be uh, controller design. So, uh, 
and of course the problem is uh, the parameters for the for the slippy terrain so uh, uh, you did uh, quite a, quite many experiments so is it possible again to take the parameters and uh, uh, say that this is uh, uh, my slip terrain in the sense that use it uh, to model slip for uh, for a vehicle, a motorcycle in our case. Um, maybe I have to think a little bit more about this, but the way that we conducted the study uh, mm -hmm. was to impose the slip. So okay. for us, the slip is predefined and we wanted to see how uh, the slip affects the, the tractive force. I see. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, we so also we... did some free rolling mm -hmm. uh, uh, studies, but um, that, I mean, it would, it would require kind of using it in reverse, you know, if you can measure your your tractive force can you from that deduce what the slip is to to adjust uh, the torque on the tire to minimize it such that you can gain more traction right that would be mm -hmm. the idea yeah um i i guess it could be adapted but again the way it was designed was more for analysis um and um and less for using it for control purposes the only mm -hmm. place where we use it kind of for control purposes was in the in the car sim simulation um okay. where the student basically incorporated the model as being the the tractive force versus sleep model at the interface um by readjusting Majeka, uh, Pacheca's uh, magic formula uh, parameters based yeah. on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much. So uh, uh, may I contact you later and Absolutely. ask about some papers? Yeah. yeah, because I would pass them to, to my students. We were, we were using Pacheca model, but you know uh, how hard it is um we we have one uh, monograph where the complete set of parameters is available for the motorcycle but still it's really hard to change something and then adopt the model so thank you so much and i will contact you to ask for some some details and the papers absolutely uh, thank you very, so much very happy to do that thank very you. nice seeing you thank you Okay, thanks Ella for joining for joining the conversation. And uh, while we wait for for someone else to uh, to join us live, uh, if Alex or or Skalk would like would like to comment, please. Uh, Massimo, yes, I think the big comment from my side is that. Uh, the interface between the tire and the terrain is really the important thing. Uh, if we try to do vehicle dynamics, simulation, control, multi-body dynamics, it doesn't matter what we do. If we do not understand the forces generated between the tire and the road, our understanding of a bigger problem is actually uh, very weak. So I can't overemphasize the, the importance of uh, getting behind the physics and what's really happening. In this case, Corina's work uh, focusing on ice is um, definitely quite unique in the world. Uh, as, a, as an editor of a journal, I often have to find reviewers for some of the papers. And uh, it's just one of those very difficult things to find people that actually understand or have looked at tires on, on ice um, at all. So uh, yes, very important research field. Uh, our group is also doing a lot of work on tires, but we tend to focus more on the rough terrain. Not, not slippery necessarily, but rough, uh, uneven, large obstacles, things like that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Maybe we can also take some of the questions from the... Yeah, the yeah. So, yeah, I was uh, waiting if someone may, who had typed maybe wanted to to jump on the live conversation, but apparently 
not. So please, yeah, if you want to take some question from the Q&A, please go ahead. Unless Alex has anything else to to um, to add now, I'd, I'd be happy to. OK, we have someone joining us. Oh, yeah, well, I see Jordan uh, joining us. So Jordan, thank you for joining us and please. Hi, uh, Dr. Sandu, great presentation. Big fan. I follow all your papers and your students as well. Blow a little smoke uh, your way. But um, essentially, uh, my question is a little bit on um, your average ground pressure that's in your uh, your tire compact or tire patch. Do you see um, where in your soft soil models, uh, do you ever kind of get the uh, those uh, average ground pressure and inflation deflection charts? where they kind of have what you can kind of predict as what your ground pressure is going to be. A lot of that's for the hard surface. And did you see a lot of that very closely replicated on the ice? And also, have you seen on your soft soil tests a lot of the uh, reduction in the ground pressure depending on sinkages and the type of soils? Just kind of wanted to see what your perspective was on that and what you kind of seen. And okay. have you done any type of uh, really uh, iterative methods to kind of resolve that? So thank you. Thank you, Jordan. I think you. Uh... You managed to include several questions in one. <laughs> yeah, I'm complicated like that. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I'd be happy to to try and address them. Now, uh, there are more recent results I did not include in this presentation. And uh, one more recent study that was uh, finalized by Rui He, um, for that study, we really looked at using the data that we obtained by measuring the rut left by the tire to characterize the um, um, the relationship between um, even you know the the ground pressure distribution that you mentioned and the normal load that was applied and the inflation pressure and the slip ratio and the number of passes so um some of his papers are uh, available. We still have one currently in work that um, we hope to have out maybe by the end of the year. Uh, but I would I would recommend if you want to get more details, I you know uh, if you can't find his papers, but I, they are in the Journal of Terra Mechanics. Um, first name is Rui. Second uh, last name is He. H -E. mm -hmm. um, we looked in more details at that. Um, now, we also noticed uh, the, the behavior of the soil surface with different um, inflation pressures and number of passes over the same terrain. So the terrain will share differently when you have the same number of passes, but at different slip ratios and at different inflation pressures, which we also quantify in some of his papers. So I think you'll find a lot of data related to that. We even recreated the shape of the entire contact area because it's not a patch anymore, right? It's in the soil. It's, mm -hmm. it's, a, uh, it's a curved surface. Right. And that's very hard to uh to recreate using uh, i mean you can do it in finite element or you know one right. of the computational methods it's not that easy to use it for characterizing uh the performance you know in close to real time let's say if not in real time mm -hmm. now your question related to um you had a question related to ice uh and oh, yeah the the essentially the ice question was just that um just kind of verifying that it's very similar to just um, the typical hard surface such as asphalt or concrete. So what and we've been doing for ice, and again, I didn't include uh, slides in here. Uh, one of the, the recent master students, Shan Tong, uh, she developed um, a setup where we basically replace uh, three of the steel channels from the test rig um and we we eliminate the soil in that area and we replace them with a frame that supports a glass plate uh, a thick strong glass plate and we use a um, camera under the the glass plate to take a video or pictures of the tire rolling on top of the glass plate um 
luckily for us, the coefficient of friction of that glass is very close to ice. So uh, we could kind of mimic what happens with the, with the, um, the deformation of the tire in the contact area on ice by looking at what happens on, on the glass plate, uh, basically from underneath. Now, she, uh, she managed to record quite a lot of, of data. Not all of it has been very thoroughly analyzed, but the methodology is there, and I think we'll continue to, to use it because um, we don't have other ways in which we can directly visualize the tire contact area um, and, and, and for, you know, uh, for rigid surfaces. Uh, in this case. So uh, that's one approach that we are taking to, to look at the deformation as well as uh, how the, um, you know, the, the, the correlation between um, the contact area, the geometry of the contact area at the different slip ratios and, and uh, different normal loads, inflation pressures, etc. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. It's, uh, I've just been kind of looking at how a lot of the soft soil is affected and you know and there, there's copious amounts of trying to analyze and accurately predict and and simulate sinkages for certain terrains and and uh and kind of what that does with your your essentially your effective contact area what could be used for generating traction so i was just kind of very uh thank you for um answering my questions sure okay um yeah hello karina it's alex Yes, Alex. All right. Good to see you. Uh, I've, I've got my microphone switched on now. Uh, I was quite interested in uh, the wheel tester. I think just before you went on to ice, you showed us a graph of slip against uh, um, drawbar pull and the characteristic. I think it was probably for sand. Uh, probably talk around that one. There we are. That, uh, this one? Yeah, that, that, that will to do what the ones on the right uh, is uh, am I right in thinking that's uh, a, a plot on sand yes right um, when you would describe it's, it's the oil but it's yeah it's a sandy, sandy yeah. Uh, when you were describing the use of the, of the wheel tester to get the plot there I'm thinking you're probably operating the wheel tester at a fixed forward speed and then changing uh, the rotational speed of the wheel is that right yes uh have you got the ability to instead of controlling the forward speed is to actually control uh the drawbar force and then rotate the wheel at a constant speed that's that's a very good point um so the first step we take is to analyze um, the tire effective rolling radius on whatever surface we are going to test on because we definitely need that in order to know what kind of torque to apply to get the velocity that we want to create the slip that we want so this is the first thing that we are doing uh, we can control the longitudinal sleep we can control the normal load and uh, i'm trying to think if we can control the longitudinal force now the longitudinal force that the sensor measures is actually the the drawbar pull directly so it measures the difference between Tractive and, and resistive forces. Um, we try to, at some point, we try to, for example, obtain the resistive forces, knowing what you know what force we applied and what force we measured. Uh, whatever you obtain as as resistive forces will be the combination of everything that creates mm -hmm. the resistive forces. It's kind of hard to distinguish between the different components. But I'm trying to think if we could use this approach to say move back and, and change. We would still have to play with something like the torque or the velocity, but maybe that can be calculated and fed into the 
into the rig to keep a certain drawbar pull constant. I, I have to think about how to do that. Yeah, most of the tests I've done with sand have tended to be with uh, whole vehicles. And uh, when we get to the maximum, uh, we usually find that uh, uh, the wheel slip increases, the rolling resistance goes up, and we become immobilized. So um, if we were to do those tests by putting a drawbar pull instead of uh, controlling the velocity of the carriage, um, you may find it quite difficult to actually get data beyond the maximum. Mm. It's it's a good question to think about. <laughs> and uh, um, uh, the other thing which goes with that a little bit, you, you said you do triaxle and presumably cone index sorts of test. Have you tried to model the curve with any of the dimensional analysis uh, models like Turnage or Brixius or um, some of the older ones or modify uh, uh, some people working with sand have modified Brixius to change the constants for example uh, to get a better fit uh, uh, has anybody in your group looked at that side of uh, uh, no. models no um, I, I had one study way back I think maybe 10 years ago when we looked at uh, coming up with a better um, numerical or, or, yeah, numerical approach for um, for a cone penetrometer uh, type measurement, but um, and I mean we, we we did come up with a constant that gives a little bit better you know result and the slightly modified model of one of the earlier versions for numerics, but um, not much since then. Yeah, I mean, one advantage is that they're very fast to calculate. And if you're trying to work in real time, then you can obviously repeat the calculations. If you've got real time sensors on the vehicle, on the wheels, uh, then you can actually uh, modify the, the control, for example, like traction control using those models quite effectively. So it's, it, a it's another route, but. Uh, um, yeah, it's a good point. Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, just one more, and that was we, uh, last uh, two weeks ago at the conference, I, I noticed there was a paper where someone was using a small uh, single wheel tester uh, and they were applying uh, a normal load, but they weren't using dead weight. Um, and then they were getting quite a lot of vibration and variation in the load. Is that something that uh, uh, you've had with, with your... Uh, um, rig uh, i mean with the wheel tester the main wheel tester i've used i've used dead weight lots of uh, 25 kilogram uh weights to, to to add up to about 25 kilonewtons i think it was um it's a lot of work to put them on but because it's dead weight then there is no variation in the normal load and so yes. I've, I've never seen that problem before Yes, the, the, there was. Uh, when we first designed the test rig, we didn't have the normal load controller. And one of the early projects we got was for uh, the NASA Glenn Research Center study of lunar rover wheels. So they wanted to actually only apply 60 pounds pound force of load on the wheel. Uh, those were like aluminum wheels. They're not tires. Mm -hmm. And at that light load, there was a variation of 20 to 30 percent in the normal load. Uh, we, we could not maintain the, um, the load constant. Only after we implemented the normal load controller, we went to this very narrow, you know, two to three percent maximum variation. So it was it was a problem, uh, especially for lighter loads. For heavier loads, like if we tested at 8,000 Newton load, uh, the problem was not that that evident. The variation in the normal load, especially for uh, for the, the lower range of the slip ratio was, was not significant. Yeah, have you tried using dead weight for low loads at all? We, we use dead weight for offloading uh, because the carriage itself is, is heavier than 60 pounds that NASA wanted. 
So we we actually had to create like a like a pulley system to offload. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, and for that we did use gym weights, but <laughs> yeah. Uh, but not to to load it to load it it was always a pneumatic system uh air springs um and uh, we moved to uh very large air springs about 10 years ago because the the range of linear actuation for the air springs is is somewhere in the middle so uh previously we had pretty small ones and we'd reach the ends very quickly. So now we are using much bigger ones. We're staying within the, the linear range. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you, thank Alex. You. Thank you. Uh, we have minutes before we start wrapping up the event. So Corina, if you would like yeah. to get some questions. I'll, I'll get some of the questions yes, here. Okay. Have you, uh, Robin uh, Gas, have you investigated the possibility of using HSSTM to predict tire forces? from an intelligent tire um no but i think i'd be interested in in trying this uh, as long as we can get that specific intelligent tire <laughs> um i guess it will depend um you know on on in in terms of validating the two um the black box uh is the structure easy to be assembled well, the black box that we used to enclose the tire when we tested on ice was basically just uh, just the sides that were on the outside. The bottom was open and the bottom would not touch the ice, so we would not get additional friction. Uh, and it was made out of um, insulation like meal bags that have the pockets inside where you can put like uh, blue ice or packages of, of uh, frozen, you know, small, uh, small packages. It was just intended to be added and removed quickly just to make sure that for the couple of minutes that the test lasts, the tire and the ice will be at the same temperature. So it doesn't affect uh, the, the test in any way. Uh, the camera, uh, do you think the cam thermal cameras on inside of the tire alongside width will give you interesting data for the temperature, the contact patch? I think, I think that uh, that might be interesting to measure at high speeds. Indoor, we don't get such a, such a huge temperature variation to, to measure something inside. I think that if this were to be instrumented on a tire for outdoor test, it might be useful to get some data. Um, we are just going slow inside. Um, okay. Uh, am I missing any question? I think uh, I answered Ella's, uh, the black box, Andreas's thermal camera. There's an, um, an honest question about, uh, you mentioned the WITS system. What is the resolution with which oh, you can measure okay. the tire deformation? And do you measure all eight locations at the same time? That's a good point. So uh, no, we only measured one location at a time. And that's when the accelerometer tells us that we are pointing right down. So uh, there are eight, but, uh, and, and each one of them is a 25 degree, um, you know, range, but we are only measuring, we are only using the measurements from one at a time. Um, we, the only way we could actually um, validate it was offline. So before we mounted it on the tire, we had like a, a ring, with the system mounted on a wheel and you know applied load on that wheel and try to see if what the sensors measured was indeed the deflection that was measured so that's how we did the validation the resolution uh it is is not something that i can say that um you know i can give you a number right now um but it was better than nothing. <laughs> in our opinion, it was it was a good thing to have something measured in real time. Okay, so 
let me uh, just quickly bring uh, my my screen back up again. So so I would like to thank uh, Corina again for her presentation and uh, all the staff at ISTVS uh, and uh, and everyone uh, attending today. And I would also like uh, to invite uh, all um, graduate students and research professionals out there uh, to consider being our uh, next speakers for the student research seminars and uh, the Terra Mechanics Bytes. And graduate students uh, are also invited to consider joining the uh, ISTVS Research Initiative. And uh, finally, I would like to remind everyone that the ISTVS 2022 uh, membership campaign uh, is starting is starting soon. So, uh, well, now I think uh, that's really it. So, uh, thanks again, Corina, for uh, for this very uh, interesting uh, presentation, and um, thanks everyone in attendance. And see everyone uh, at the next event. Um, thank you very much, Massimo. I want to thank all of you for attending and for your questions and discussions. Um, I definitely would invite anyone who attends um, this meeting uh, and is not an ISTVS member, if you like what you see and you're interested in this area to become a member. Um, I want to thank Massimo and Jenna and everybody who helped organize uh, not only this particular talk, but also the entire series. Uh, thank you to uh, my colleagues, Ella and Alex and Scalp, who joined us on the panel here, and to everyone who asked questions and showed interest in today's presentation. So we're very excited about having the graduate students talk uh, and exchange ideas, and I look forward to seeing uh, everyone and uh, uh, please uh, distribute uh, the news about this series to your friends and colleagues and bring more people. So thank you all very much again. Well, Karina, you did you did uh, a very nice wrap up, very much better than I, I could have done. So uh, thanks for that too. And again, thank you everyone and have a nice uh, afternoon or evening or night, depending on uh, what part of the world uh, you are. <laughs> Goodbye, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye. Goodbye.